Hi, so I'm, I'm Aviv. I'm a researcher over at uh, Edgify, which is an awesome startup. And uh, although I will reveal what we're doing, uh, I, this won't be a marketing talk, so if you came for that, I apologize. And um, uh, let's talk about federated learning, or more uh, technically, uh, distributed training on the edge. And what are edge devices? Wherever you're collecting data and you also have computational power, uh, substantial computational power, uh, there you have an edge device. So for example, your smartphones, but also uh, self-checkout systems or some cameras that are connected and have some CPU or uh, aut autonomous cars or internet of things in general. There are many kinds of edge devices. And currently, when we want to train on them, when we're trying to, um, first of all, currently when we're talking about AI on the edge, usually what people uh, mean is just the inference stage, right? But, uh, and how does the cycle go more generally? You take all the data, let's see if this works. You take all the, all the you take all the data from the edge devices to the central server where you uh, have your training on that data using uh, the data on the model to get the gradients that you're then reusing over, uh, using to update the model and over and over again, that's your training cycle. And then you uh, deploy it to the, back to the edge devices to use that, what you've learned. Um, but there are a few issues here. First of all, we're sending the data that's on the edge devices, and uh, that's growing and growing amounts of data, uh, while network is still important. So uh, you've got network considerations. You've also got privacy considerations, because maybe you don't want to send all that private data from your smartphones to Google, for example, uh, or to a central server. Um, and uh, lastly, you have, sometimes it is the case that you simply have a computational power on the edge device that you're not making use of when you're just sending that data away. So there seems to be a substantial motivation to do things differently and have your training done at least partially on the edge itself. So uh, what you do is have the tra basic training loop uh, be performed on the edge. Um, sorry, I can't do both, I'll focus on talking. Um, you just use the data on the model locally, the local data that you have on the edge devices on the model that you have there to get a gradient, a local gradient, but you send all those local gradients to the server to aggregate them together, to sum up or to average, and then you send it back to the edge devices uh, alongside those from all the others, and then you have your updated model. So that's sort of equivalent to a standard distributed uh, training, but remember that uh, you have uh, local batches from many devices, so all in all you have quite a large batch. So that's what's uh, known as a large batch, but in a distributed version of the learning stage. Um, and now you're sending the gradients over the network, not the data itself. So what do you gain by that? Uh, first of all, you get this basic form of privacy because you're no longer sending your data. That's not enough in itself because you are sending something about the data that may reveal things about the data that you wouldn't want to reveal. So privacy is not assured by that, but that's a very first, very important first step is not to send your data. Uh, Besides that, you are making substantial use of the computational power that you may have on your edge device. But in terms of networking, you're not sending data, but just gradients about it, but you're doing it over and over again each and every training cycle. Uh, so that's where federated learning comes in and says that, well, maybe not, let's not send uh, data over the network each and every time, but let ha let's have uh, iterations, local iterations of uh, training be performed on the edge device. So now, uh, you're doing your training on the edge device for quite a few cycles, using the data and the model uh, to get a gradient, and then again to get a new model, an updated model, and again and again for quite a few phases, and then send the model, the weights or the deltas between the previous model and the current model, uh, whatever works best, you send that to the server. 
There you can aggregate all of them together from all the edge devices and spread them over all the edge devices as the new model that everyone is using now. So that's basically a federated learning which takes the large batch distributed training further. And now, just to stress that we're no longer sending gradients, but we're sending the weights themselves of the models. Uh, so now we do get this basic form of privacy as before, and making substantial use of the computational power at the edge. And we seem to be gaining something by uh, doing something about the networking issue as well. Um, so when I just came into the head of the field and came into it uh, at the beginning of 2019, it was just a matter of reading a few existing papers and knowing everything there is to know about what's going on. But since then, the field has been uh, blowing up and there's a lot of research and a lot of frameworks that you can now use and, now, and that all came in the past half a year. There aren't that many applications, however. Uh, Google's famous uh, keyboard on your smartphones is one singular example, but there aren't many, and we need to wonder why. And maybe I'll come back to this slide at the end if we have time, but for now, let's uh, just get into the uh, mess messier details of the challenges of this sort of uh, training. So uh, from the outset, outset have in mind, please have in mind a few factors here. The first is that we need to consider the number of uh, edge devices we are using. So when you're using smartphones, for example, uh, on the Google keyboard, then you're talking about tens of millions and even hundreds of millions of devices. And then you need to do sophisticated machinery in order to select subsets and operate on them because you can't do it all together all at once. Uh, so that complicates things, but I won't be getting into that. There's also a substantial interest and in many applications that do not concern uh, this amount of devices. The second issue, which is critical to this sort of a distributed training, is the way the data is distributed among the edge devices. Because when we classically send it all together, we could just pick out our batches randomly by sampling randomly and not worrying about the distribution of each and every batch. But now we depend on the way the data is given to us. So we're not moving it from one place to another. So however it is given to us, that's what we have. And if you consider a supermarket, for example, with the cameras watching over you and the products that you're taking, then some cameras will be seeing vegetables, others will be seeing meat, and each one is operating on slightly or even substantially different part of the whole data set. And so they are learning different things, and then putting it all together doesn't necessarily work, work as well, or is suspected not to work as well. Last but not least is the communication, because when we're spreading it to the edge devices and network becomes a critical factor, both in terms of its bandwidth, but also in terms of uh, latency. And that has many influences on, on which algorithm or how to set it up, uh, depending on your network setup. Um, a few simplifying assumptions for the sake of the talk. Uh, so never mind having too many devices, let's just say all of them take part in the training. Furthermore, they do so in a synchronized way. That means that they are all training, all doing their own thing, and then uh, we wait until all of them have finished doing that thing and uh, collecting all of the data together to get to the next step. And uh, furthermore, I'm assuming uh, the network structure of the single central server, although you can think of more complicated yet more efficient ways to do it otherwise. And uh, separately from all these, I'll be specific. Please keep in mind, have in mind only deep learning uh, for the uh, machine learning algorithm we're trying to uh, distribute here. There is a lot of interest in talking about simpler uh, algorithms because of all the challenges that there are to uh, federated learning. You may want to do that for simpler algorithms, which would work better, even linear regression. But here, uh, let's keep our eyes on the holy grail. And uh, now let's have a comparison between these two approaches that I've, basic approaches that I've presented. I stress again that large batch uh, that has no inner uh, training cycles. It just keeps sending the gradients back to the server and gets the updated model. Whereas federated learning trains independently for a few cycles or more than a few cycles and you can control this parameter at each edge device before synchronizing. So 
presented as such, large which is more conservative, federated averaging is a, the more radical approach, and that being radical here is nothing good in itself because, for example, you have to uh, rediscover training methodologies and hyperparameters that fit certain situations, so in and of itself I'm giving large batch a star for being better in that respect. Um, and let's see a basic representative experiment comparing between the two, uh, nothing too drastic, uh, running on CIFAR, which is a medium uh, difficulty task with a ResNet 18, just a standard network, and this distributed setting is such that there you have 96 devices, which each get their own part of the data distributed evenly. <laughs> so we're not complicated in anything in that respect as well. And the yellow one, the, the fastest one in terms of epochs, is a centralized server. A large batch may take a little longer uh, because working with a large batch can be challenging, but federated learning takes way longer in terms of epochs. But on the other hand, it does manage to reach, in this experiment, the required accuracy. So uh, our next line on the comparison table is also goes for large batch because federated averaging simply takes more epochs. But remember, uh, the point of federated averaging, or, um, which was to save on the communication cycles, which may slow you down in the large batch case, which I haven't shown you here. So when you do look at those, uh, federated averaging for, for reaching 80% accuracy, for example, requires only 140 uh, train, uh, communication cycles whereas large batch requires many more, even though it used less epochs. So if network is uh, your bottleneck, then you might be better off using federated averaging. So that goes for federated averaging. However, uh, how much we're communicating and how, much we're, how good we do given our constraints of communication does not depend simply on the number of times you're sending packets. Right? It also depends on the amounts that you're sending. So we need to think about comp compression methods. And maybe we can just use standard compression methods for network in general, but given specific algorithms, we might be able to do better by adjusting compression schemes to this, these algorithms of distribution. So let's talk a bit about compression. Um, so I'll just mention two uh, methods. Uh, the first is quantization and the second is sparsification and each one you may try to apply either to the weights or the deltas between the weights for the case of the federated averaging or you may try to use it on the gradients uh, themselves which would be useful for the large batch version. Uh, quantization is pretty almost trivial form of compression where you simply represent your data in a lower precision. And still, there are quite a few methods how to do that uh, well, but uh, I'll just mention one, which is the float to int, just taking uh, the 32 bits of the float to the 8 bits of the integer. And this is widely used for by ha and supported both by hardware and by software frameworks, because, and it's mostly used for inference in this case, but we can try to apply it to the training process as well, and we can. Uh, we've tried and it doesn't work that well for the model weights, but it does work well for the deltas between the previous model and the next model we are about to send to the server from the edge device, so it is useful for federated averaging. And it's used for, and it is, and it does work on gradients as well, so we can use it for the large batch. Uh, but that's a rather trivial and not very efficient way of compressing things. There are much more sophisticated ways. Uh, an important family of these are sparsifications, so here in, in this case of the gradients, where we figure out which parts we need to send and which parts are actually redundant, and then we drop all these below some threshold. Uh, some complications here that the threshold may be either fixed, predefined, or maybe you can change it in runtime according to different uh, metrics. And uh, within this family of compression techniques, I'll just mention one, which is deep gradient compression, uh, which is rather sophisticated, and it not only passes 
on to the network the data that it does need to uh, send because it's above the threshold, but it also aggregates and keeps what's below the threshold to uh, check out what will happen in uh, next cycles. And because we're doing lossy compression, we're bringing a noise into the process, we might be, uh, pardon my French, screwing up the process. So you need to take a host of uh, techniques and measures in order to preserve accuracy and uh, convergence speed, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is much more sophisticated, but with, with much better uh, compression rates, like on the order of 1,000. Uh, and just to have a standard experiment, you, comparing these methods, and you can take from this simply that they do manage to reach the required accuracy, even if it takes some more time because there are complexities here regarding the metrics, which may be uh, relying on things that the compression scheme changes. So never mind these details, but you can get it to work on large batch, on federated learning as well, I'm not showing you, but you can use the flow to int and make it work, but it's much less efficient. So when you look at the tables, ultimately, when you want to ask how much data I've been passing around, then uh, in this experiment where you uh, reach lower accuracy on the federated averaging, just 90%, okay? But it's pretty close to the 93% of the large batch. But in terms of how much you actually sent over the network, large batch does five times as good as federated averaging, okay, because of the compression scheme. So even though a priori it should have been worse because federated averaging comes to improve upon communication, but large batch, more, the, less con the more conservative move away, requires fewer epochs and has higher compression rates because it's simpler and allows for better compression, compression schemes. So that actually goes for large batch as well. Um, and uh, so much for networking. Now let's talk about one last substantial challenge for this talk, uh, type of uh, federation, uh, which as I mentioned is the way the data is spread around uh, in the, on the edge devices. So a uh, large batch is pretty much equivalent to classical centralized uh, setting, but that's not always the case even for the simpler large batch training. Uh, because consider, for example, batch normalization, which is uh, very common in many common architectures of uh, deep learning. What happens there is that you're relying on the local batch statistics for the part of the training, but then you rely on the global statistics for the prediction, and without getting into these details at all, I'm just pointing out that this doesn't work uh, out of the box. You need to do something, and you need to do quite a lot, and we've uh, found various solutions, like replacing the uh, batch normalization by something called group normalization, or uh, getting rid of this type of normalization altogether and using a fix of the, of the initialization it's, uh, instead. So there are ways to handle it, but note the difficulty here that you're not simply, by trying to distribute your algorithms this way, you're not simply reshuffling things and then you have to research for your hyper parameters. Instead, you have to make more substantial changes. And so that goes for large batch, it goes for federated averaging as well. Uh, but even when you handle these kind of problems, you're left with the substantial problem of having the data be different at each and every, uh, at some of the edge devices than the others. And what happens there is that when you're doing independent training on each one of them, each model learns something very different. They go astray in terms of what they're learning, and then when you try to combine them and average them together, that simply doesn't work. So a federated averaging, which takes this uh, very far, suffers heavily when you're trying to um, uh, do this method on non-IID data, data that is spread unevenly. Um, so, we did come up with a different algorithm than the current classical one of just averaging everything together, and we'll, pre we'll, be, presenting, we'll be presenting it at uh, NeurIPS next month in Vancouver. But, um, and this algorithm compels the local models to converge to a shared optimum. So keeping an eye on what the other models are doing, but there are complexities where you don't want to uh, 
invalidate the setting and start sending too much information about uh, your data it's, and uh, invalidate privacy, etc. So this goes some way in uh, uh, making the situation better, but still federated averaging suffers greatly when the data is not uh, IID. Uh, and that's actually the bottom line I have here for comparison between these two, which leaves us with, with an unsatisfying non-winner but I hope that it at least makes clear that the more buzzword, the buzzword of uh, federated averaging should uh, still be taken with a grain of salt uh, when you're trying to decide what's best for your situation. Uh, so that's when comparing between them. And some problems, fundamental problems here are still not solved at all. So for example, when you're trying in computer vision to uh, work on ImageNet, with a, which is a larger, harder uh, vision task, but you have high latency on your network, this means that large batch won't work well enough because it has to communicate too many times, but federated averaging uh, doesn't work uh, either in that situation. So we simply don't have a, there are simply no uh, current solutions for many of the common problems that you need to handle. Um, and the overall view I hope you take from this is that the basic algorithms, the, way, the basic methods to distribute the processes, the processes are not the beginning of the story. Uh, it just, uh, when you make that fundamental change, everything else changes and you need to manage quite a lot around it in order to get it to work. So it's just the beginning of the story. Uh, I, maybe I can mention a few of, of what's going on. How much time do I have? 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, let's uh, mention a few of the things that are going on. Um, so in terms of research, uh, you can guess all the fundamental issues of optimization and communication efficiency, but besides that, there is a lot going on on the, particularly a lot going on on the, on the aspect of privacy. Um, combining uh, this sort of distribution with many existing topics and methods of differential privacy and encryption and lots else that is going on and even with blockchain, as long as we're in the business of uh, buzzwords, blockchain actually makes sense here because it allows you to decouple the training on the data from where the data actually sits. And um, another to interesting topic is adversariality where so far I've been for this talk, I was simply assuming that we are in control of the edge devices and the algorithms that are running on them. But when you're working on smartphones, for example, some may go astray. Someone may maliciously change the, what it is sending through the network, and you might want your algorithm to be secure against this kind of mishandling. Um, many other topics that you find in machine learning relate to these very basic changes to the way the training is performed and by now you have whole conferences on federated learning as well as a workshop at uh, NeurIPS, etc. Uh, in terms of frameworks, as I mentioned until half a year ago there was nothing, uh, but now we do have TensorFlow, TensorFlow federated which is not completely it doesn't really support a production as well as it should, but it is used for experiments on the, for researchers uh, on these kind of uh, algorithms. We also have uh, OpenMind, which came out with PySift, which is very PyTorchy and very convenient. And they also have an online course together with Udacity, which lets you get into toy examples very quickly. Uh, WeBank is the largest digital bank in China and they have their own framework, but they also cooperate with the Linux Foundation and they're working with many other industry uh, partners on a standard for federated learning and working on something completely rather different that I haven't even mentioned that they call vertical federated learning. And Baidu have their own framework and other companies have frameworks that are focused on uh, the medical realm, for example, which is uh, one of the obvious places to go with this kind of uh, training, and I'd like to thank the whole AI research team over at Edgify, and we also have a, a large engineering team not mentioned here, but also doing, making it all work, and we have a series of blogs, so if you want to get deeper into these details and see all the references for everything that's going on, etc., then uh, look it up, and feel free to contact us and contact me specifically if you're 
considering or think it might be worth your while to go in, the, in those directions. And yes, I think that's the last slide. Thank you. And since we have time, I'll be happy to take questions. Or later, if you, yeah. But speak up for the rest of the crew. <laughs> ah, sorry. I'll repeat it. Sure. So you're asking whether we are looking at the classical way to have a training on the cloud? I guess that by definition you don't have much to gain, so no. Okay, so the question is what do we do when, uh, in cases where the uh, models are very large, like uh, current uh, things in, uh, what do you have, which ones do you have in mind? Probably BERT or things, I don't know. Uh, when you have very large models and you need to send a lot over the network, maybe it's as big as the data. Uh, I don't know how common that is because when we're talking about many edge devices, you do get data from here, from that, from that, and you're aggregating it all together. So you do have a lot more data all together than the, each and every model. So I don't know how common the situation you're describing is, but in that case, when you have to send too much over the network, then yeah, these me methods won't give you much. So they're not fit for every situation. Yes? Could you speak louder for me as well this time? Okay, so uh, again, uh, she's asking about the challenge that I mentioned. Let's see if I can roll back to it a bit too far. Oh, I was right at the place. Um, so the challenge is when the data is distributed in a highly non-even fashion. Uh, and the problem was, I repeat it, that each and every edge device might be training on very different data. So the model that it's training and uh, is very different from the next one, the other edge device, and where you're trying to combine them together, this doesn't work. So in terms of research, yes, there is a lot of research being done on how to handle it. Some of it might be somewhat detrimental to the spirit of federated learning. For example, by sending parts of the data from between the edge device, you might be able to even out the distribution a bit, but that goes against the point of what you're trying to do, but it does make some sense in certain situations. And as I mentioned, we also have, maybe too quickly at the end, we also have our own in-house algorithm that also tries to handle this situation, and we could get a bit into the details, but basically we're, it goes through the Fisher information metrics and Hessians and all these kinds of stuff that I don't want to get into here, but basically you're uh, encouraging them to go in the same direction in a way that will then make sense when you're trying to average them, so that's one partial solution. It's imperfect. It doesn't... Uh, still, the problem is inherent to federated learning, and I don't know that we ever could solve it completely, because it is inherent to the situation that you're learning different things, but then trying to combine them, and uh, that doesn't simply work by averaging, nor by more sophisticated methods, at least at the moment. Yes? Uh, yeah. Ah, but you're further away, so I'm uh, sorting by the distance, sorry. Sorry, who is speaking? I'm uh, missing. Sorry, I can't see you. Where are you? Ah, okay. 
Again, sorry. So uh, uh, maybe the point is that it's not the direction to will try to even the distribution against the uh, you want to consider the fine tune the performance of the node in the its, uh, its, uh, its natural environment. Are you suggesting to send data from the node to other nodes? Yes. Okay, so I mentioned that when I said that this goes against the spirit of federated learning, which where the whole point was to keep the data on the device where it was, which is what we're trying to do. Maybe we can't do it as, as good as we hoped, and maybe we do have to uh, go to such approaches that do move the data around somewhat, but, uh, but we would like not to do that if we don't have to. And that, and, uh, and I should note that these are the questions at the very heart of the research here. So any good method you come up with, up with will quickly get you into a top conference, if that's what you're looking for. Other questions? Again, you can find me later too, and find us on the net. Thank you very much. <laughs>